we should sit down because we have two amazing talks this morning. So uh, let's settle down. Okay, so uh, thank you for coming to the first session. As I said, we have an amazing computer scientist and an amazing mathematician. So you're in for some wonderful lectures. The first lecture is by John Hopcroft, uh, who is um, a Turing medalist 30 years ago, actually, for the design and analysis of algorithms and data structures. John has done so much for the field. I mean, that you know, was already acknowledging fantastic work, but John has gone on to lead the field in new areas as they arise. For me personally, uh, John has meant a great deal. We are close collaborators and friends. Uh, he decided it was time to start doing graph algorithms uh, about, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago. And we started working together on those. Uh, he's, he really always leads the field. But I think even more significant to him today is his involvement with, uh, uh, with education worldwide. Uh, he is about to have a profound effect on China. He has been working in China for the last decade or so. The Premier of China has been meeting with him recently, and he has a plan for revamping university education in China. And he has the Premier's ear, which is what you want in China. He is also about to receive the Friendship Medal, which is the highest medal that a foreigner can achieve in China. So uh, the, the students should really um, be inspired by John, who has both advanced the field intellectually and had a huge impact on future, uh, future generations. John Hopcroft. Uh, uh, it, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today and have this opportunity to talk to you uh, about uh, science and specifically about computer science. One, one of the things uh, I'd like to mention to the younger people, uh, you're also very fortunate because this is a time of change. Uh, science is changing in a fundamental way. Uh, the future is, is going to be probably biology and information and those people, those individuals, those nations, those companies which position themselves for the future uh, will have great, great rewards. So uh, I'm not knowledgeable about biology, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about information science. And what I thought I would do is just focus on a few of the exciting research problems. One of the things is computer science has changed the last 40 years, we were involved in making computers useful. But the future is going to be how those computers are used. And the problems that are coming up from application areas are just exciting. So uh, there's just a list of maybe 100 ex exciting problems. But due to the limited time, I can only talk about a couple. So I'll talk about hidden structure and social networks and some advances in learning theory. But this is just a, a sample of the exciting range of problems available for you. So in social networks, uh, we have uh, graphs where the vertices uh, might be people, they might be papers, they might be genes. And uh, if they're people, there might be a link if two of them are maybe our friends, something like that. And what we're interested in is the structure in these networks. Now, if you took the physics archive where now, and you created a social network where the nodes are research papers, and you took a clustering algorithm, it would probably cluster them according to topic, whether it was physics, chemistry, math, or biology. 
but it turns out there's some other structure there. Um, if you looked very carefully at the words that were used and the structure of sentences, you might be able to classify the papers, whether they're survey papers, expository papers, or research papers. Or you might be able to cluster them as to whether the author was an English-speaking author or an Asian author where English was the second language or some other way. Uh, similarly, you might be able to cluster them as to whether the paper was written by an established author or a young author. And it's these kinds of structures that I'm going to refer to as the hidden structure. Uh, to give you another example, consider handwritten characters. You might want to cluster them according to what the character is, or do you want to cluster uh, the, the letter as to the person that wrote it? Uh, and just to give you some examples, uh, if you were to cluster these letters, uh, the basic clustering would be by the character. But if you look very carefully at the, the letters up there, you'll notice some of them are in black and some of them are in gray. Uh, you'll also notice that there are three type fonts. And these are the hidden structure. And this is the kind of structure that is interesting to try to find. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, discovering hidden structure. And this work started uh, because researchers in the area knew that if you write a clustering algorithm, it's going to work better if you test it on synthetic data than it will if you test it on real data. And the question is why? Well, it turns out the synthetic data, people create, put, add random noise, uncorrelated random noise. But in real data, what looks like uncorrelated random noise is really this correlated structure due to the hidden structure. So I'll just give you an example. If you're going to create synthetic data, uh, you'll take an adjacency matrix, you'll put some of the, the vertices into groups that you want to be clusters, and you'll add a lot of edges in the groups, and that, that's, um, that's this here. Then you'll add some random noise. Then you'll permute the rows and columns. And what you clustering is to take this matrix and find out how to permute the rows and columns back to give you the clusters. But what you could have done, instead of adding random noise, when you take the dominant structure, you could permute the rows and columns and then add a hidden structure, permute the rows and columns, and ask people to pull out both the dominant and the hidden structure. And I'll just show you one. Uh, this is a, an adjacency matrix I created. And I asked students to cluster it. And some of them said, we found the clustering. Uh, there are three clusters. There are no edges between them. We ought to get an A. Others said, we found this clustering. Uh, five clusters, no edges between them. Turns out they're both right. I just embedded these two structures into the network, and this just gives you, shows you what the structure of these networks is like. So finding hidden structure. Uh, and, and this is uh, some work um, where what we did is uh, created a framework for we first would find the dominant structure, we would then weaken it, and we would then apply the algorithm again to find the, the hidden structure. And in some real data, we were able to find seven levels of structure going down. Um, and what I thought, uh, one other thing that we did is we learned how to improve clustering algorithms. Uh, we took five state-of-the-art clustering algorithms, and I'll show you what, what happened, but we improved all of them. Uh, what we did is, after we weakened the dominant structure to find the hidden structure, we went back to the original network and weakened the hidden structure and applied the algorithm again. And this improved uh, most of the common clustering algorithms that are in the literature today. Um, so I thought I would give you a, an example. Uh, we took some synthetic data, we applied a clustering algorithm, 
And the large circles are the clusters the algorithm gave us. The small circles are, of course, the nodes. And the color of the small circle is the actual cluster it belongs in. And people who write these clustering algorithms say they did very well when they could do this well. But what we did is we weakened this structure, and we applied the algorithm again, and we found this hidden structure. And here, once again, the color of the vertex is the cluster it should belong in. But look what happens when we go back and weaken this hidden structure and reapply the algorithm. Then we weaken the new dominant structure to find the hidden. And let, let me show you that in a slightly different form. Uh, this is the first version of the dominant structure. After we weaken the hidden structure, this was what we got for the dominant. After a number of iterations, this is what we got, and then this is what we got. And you can see that we significantly improved the clustering algorithm. Now, uh, you might ask what happened to the hidden structure. Well, the same thing, it, it improved also. The other question in your mind, since I said algorithms work much better on synthetic data than real data, how about showing us what happened on real data? So we took the Rice Facebook data. These are students at Rice. Uh, we clustered, used a clustering, and by the way, we tried this with five different clustering algorithms, and all of them behaved uh, as you're going to see in a minute. So this is the dominant structure they found, and we colored the vertices afterwards by what they should have found. Uh, after you weaken the hidden structure, uh, you do better, better, and better. And what we really discovered afterwards is the nine clusters that you end up with correspond to what dormitory the student lives in. Um, then, of course, you might say, well, show us the hidden structure. Um, it went something like this. And you can see how much the, originally this was the hidden. And you can see we did much better. And it turns out these four clusters correspond to whether you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior. And you'll notice there's a couple other vertices. They may not show up in here. Uh, apparently, there must be some students who didn't finish in four years or something. Uh, it, it turns out there are two other levels of hidden structure, but we don't know what they correspond to. So uh, we'll just leave that that way. Uh, this, this work on hidden structure was actually done jointly with Kun Hur, who is sitting back here about the fifth row back. Uh, and the way it got started is interesting. Uh, because uh, what she did, she simply asked the question, why do clustering algorithms work better on synthetic than on real? And when this notion of uh, the correlation, what appeared to be random noise, came up, uh, that's what led to this work. And, and it, it was really, she was the primary uh, researcher on it. Uh, some other work that's of interest is finding uh, local communities. Uh, if you're clustering a graph with a billion vertices in it, uh, you don't want to find clusters of 100 million vertices. What you want to find is maybe clusters of size 50. And the question is, uh, if you want to find what is the community that an individual was in, that doesn't make too much sense because the individual is probably in several communities. So what you want to do is you want to take a couple of people uh, until you have enough that it uniquely defines a, a community. Okay, so this is, I just wanted to just tell you this is an exciting area. There's lots of research going on, but I want to just pick another area because my real goal is just to say there's exciting things to work on. Uh, not that any one of these is particularly important, so important. So I'm going to talk a little bit about machine learning. Uh, so in, in machine learning, uh, you have something called a, a threshold logic unit. Uh, you have an input vector. And each input has a weight. And this device computes the sum of the input times the weight. 
And if it adds up to less than the threshold, it outputs a zero. Otherwise, it outputs a one. Okay. And it turns out there's a simple algorithm for training this, this device. Uh, if the data is linearly separable, uh, all you have to do is initialize the weight vector to be the first input, and then test every input by multiplying it times the weight vector. If the answer is incorrect, then you add the, the pattern to the weight. And this, this method will converge very fast. And the reason I wanted to mention it to you is not so much that interested in threshold logic, but it's this last Notice that the weight vector will be a linear combination of the patterns. Because initially you set it equal to a pattern, and every time you modify it, you either add it or subtract it to a pattern. And if the data is linearly separable, it'll find a solution. Uh, but what if the data is not linearly separable? Well, what you might want to do is map the data to a higher dimensional space. So um, here is some data which is obviously not linearly separable. But if you add a third coordinate z, which is equal to x squared plus y squared, you'll pull these points out from the board, and the farther they are from the origin is the farther they'll come out. And you can see it will be easily linearly separate, separable. And what you could do then is you could run the algorithm that I showed you uh, in the space you're going to map uh, the data to. But the difficulty is you may map it to an infinite dimensional space, and it may be very difficult to compute this function. And you don't want to have to compute the function. Uh, it turns out you don't have to really map the data to that space. All you need to know is products of images in that space. Because here's, here's my da original data, I map it to some space, and when I run the algorithm in that space, the weight vector is a linear combination of the patterns. And now, if I want to multiply the mapping of a pattern times the weight vector, notice all I need to know is the product. And if I have to update the weight vector, all I have to do is increase the coefficient by one. So I can run the algorithm without ever computing the function as long as I have the products. And that leads to something called a kernel, which is simply the matrix of products. And so rather than pick a function, why don't I pick a matrix? And the question is, can I just pick any old matrix I want? Well, I better pick a matrix for which there exists a function that gives rise to that matrix. And it turns out you can easily prove that, that as long as the matrix is positive, semi-definite, everything is OK. okay. So um, just to give you an example of a kernel, uh, it might be one where you simply take the difference of the two patterns and take the exponential to that value. So it's very easy to calculate the product. OK. And uh, there are many other kernels. And this, this is the essence of uh, support vector machines. And um, it's, it's an interesting area, because one of the questions we asked is, are all social networks the same? And what we did is we took a number of communities. We took a support vector machine to recognize which network those communities came from. Then we took some test data and asked, could it classify them correctly? And it did. And that was a convincing argument that the communities are different. And people who are going to write clustering algorithms maybe want to write clustering algorithms for the actual community they're going to use them for. Uh, but the next advance I want to talk about is, is deep learning. And uh, this is a very interesting area. Um, and what interests me is in the past, in learning theory, we did something called supervised learning. We would label a large amount of data, and then we would train a network. But people have discovered that they don't need to do supervised learning, that you, there's actually a way that you can learn without labeling the data. And what they did is they created a, a network with a large number of gates. They put an image in here, 
and they train this network to produce the image out here. So, for example, they never labeled images as cats, dogs, or things like that. But it turns out these internal representations of the images uh, sorted this information out. And there's actually a code which corresponds to cat, even though they never said which images are cats and which are not. And the fact that we can starting to do unsupervised learning is going to be an entirely new area. Uh, now, to train this network, uh, you have to create an error function. It needs to be differentiable. Uh, convergence time is important. Uh, overfitting is going to be very important because now people are training networks which have a billion weights. Uh, and so it's very likely you're going to overfit, but people are developing methods to, to handle the overfitting problem. So the first thing is they changed that threshold logic unit. Uh, first, they went to something called a sigmod function, which is differentiable. But it turns out an even better choice is a function which is zero for negative values and then an equal to the value if it's positive. Also differentiable and much easier to differentiate. Uh, and the way you might train this network, uh, because there, people use a lot more than seven levels. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the number of levels. But what you might do is you might train the first level, because it's reasonably, you only are adjusting weights here and here. Once you've done that, you might freeze these weights and train these, and then add another level and another level until you have the whole network trained. Okay. Now, uh, some of the research questions is, what do individual gates learn? Um, how does what the second level gates differ from what the first level learns? Um, how does the gates, uh, what they learn, change over time? We were doing an experiment where we were looking at just rectangles and size of rectangles and orientation. And what we noticed is that three gates started to learn size, but then two of them decided they weren't needed and switched to something else. And just understanding what's going on in this learning process is a very exciting problem. Uh, what if you train the network twice, starting with two different random weight sets of weights? Would it learn the same thing, or would it learn different features? Um, the, these are things that uh, are just exciting questions. Uh, so do gates learn the same thing? Uh, what you might do is you might take two gates and calculate the variance. Uh, so you sum over all images uh, this formula. I, I, I won't go into it. Um, uh, I, I, I'm just wondering if I hope these slides will be made available to anybody who wants them so they don't have to uh, copy too much. But what you could do is you could create a matrix where the gates from one network are here, the other here, and the covariance is put in here. And you would pick. Um, the biggest number and say those two gates are sort of learning the same thing. And people who do this end up with something like this. Uh, these two gates learn the same thing, these two, these two. Then here, they didn't exactly learn the same thing, but there are two gates that learn the same subspace. And then here there are three gates that learn the same subspace, it's just the two uh, networks had different bases for that subspace. Um, and by, by the way, I'm talking about things now that people are act, actually working on. So these, these are open research questions as to what's going on. Uh, this, this work really, one of the drivers was uh, image recognition. And there was a contest uh, where each year people were improving performance. And uh, what they did, since they were dealing with images, instead of using a fully connected network, which sort of like I showed, uh, they have, they take a small, uh, usually it's five by five, but I showed three by three pattern here. And they connect it to a, to a, a threshold logic unit. And they slide this pattern across, and they get a number uh, a number of gates, and these all have the same weights. So they're, they're learning the same feature, 
but they're learning the feature in different locations. But since you want to learn many different features, uh, you have a number of sets of these gates. Okay, and this is sort of the, the form, and um, it's called a convolution. So this square here sort of represents this little pattern that you're moving across. Uh, then what they do to reduce the number of weights is they have something they call a pooling level. And it's not critical precisely where the feature is found. Uh, so they maybe take four squares and combine them into one. Uh, that's what this pooling does. Um, it's, what's really important is if you find, is what's the relationship between these, these features. Okay. So uh, they have a convolution, whoops, I went the wrong way. Um, they have a, a network which has a number of convolution levels followed by a number of fully connected levels and then something called softmax. Uh, what softmax does is the following. If you have maybe a thousand categories uh, and you put an image in here, uh, for each of the possible categories, it tells you what the probability is that the image is in that category. Okay? Uh, now, this is uh, a very simple network. The early networks maybe had nine levels, uh, then they went to 15 levels then they went to 100 levels. And actually, there's a faculty member at Cornell who figured out how to train 1,000 levels and you know, realized there's a million weights at each level. So he was doing gradient descent on a billion parameters. And the question is how to do it and to do it so it'll converge in reasonable time um, and so on. So let me just show you some exciting things. Uh, if you take an image, and what I'm going to do, let me back up. I'm going to call this here the activation vector for an image. And this is image. This is the vector you will get at some point in the network. But what you'd like to do is take a point in activation space and say what image created it. So the way you do it is you pick a random image. Uh, you find its activation vector. And then you do gradient descent on the pixels of this random image to move the activation vector to the activation vector that you want to reconstruct. And that will give you the image that gave rise to that activation vector. Uh, the reason I wanted to uh, show that is I could use this level to say this is the content of the image. And out here, uh, in, instead of look, looking at the vector, I will take the covariance of it and say uh, this is the style of the image. And I will combine the content with the style using parameters and that would allow me to reconstruct an image in a different style. So we took a picture of George Bush, uh, we took 200 pictures of old people, uh, we used for the activation the, what, the uh, style of the old people, and then we created uh, George Bush uh, a little bit older. Uh, there are researchers who did this long before us, so I should mention some of their work. Uh, here are some researchers who took an image, and then they reconstructed it in a style to get this, and then they reconstructed it in a style to get this. Um, it turns out uh, that I bring 30 or 40 students from China over to Cornell for a month to expose them to a US university. And this year we picked deep learning as the project. And um, so one of them took an image, they took a style, they recreated the image, and then they recreated it. But what was interesting uh, is this one. Uh, they call it Chinese painting meets Cornell campus. Uh, this is, there were 40 Asians there, and one of them took a picture of Cornell University. They took Chinese painting, and they said, let's recreate Cornell uh, according to the Chinese image. And uh, this is Cornell uh, if it was in China, I guess. 
Uh, another, another student uh, happened to go to Seattle first and had a picture of the Space Needle and played with that. So th these are just interesting things that you can do. Uh, th these were undergraduates, by the way, uh, th that were just playing. But there's just uh, a large number of exciting research areas in computer science. I just picked two areas because that's all the time I have. But there are literally hundreds of interesting research areas like this. Uh, so I'll just mention a few, few things that, that we do. Uh, a local community structure, very, very interesting. What, what really is the structure of Facebook? That would be an, is an interesting thing. Uh, we're dealing with graphs with two to the hundred vertices. Now you might say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, that's more than the number of atoms in the visible universe. How do you store these graphs in the computer? Uh, it turns out we can do a random walk on a graph like this uh, on a computer uh, because you don't have to store the entire graph. All you need is an algorithm that, given a vertex, will tell you what the adjacent vertices are. But you might say, well, wait a minute. If you want your algorithm a random walk to converge, um, I can't wait for two to the hundred steps. Well, it turns out that if, if your graph is, is, uh, has a certain property, the random walk will converge in the logarithm of the number of steps. In other words, uh, you will be at a vertex equal to the probability a random walk would get there within 100 steps rather than 2 to the 100. Uh, another thing that we, we're starting to do is store random vectors. If you have a random vector which is a trillion bits long, you may not want to use that much space on your iPhone to store this random vector. Well, what we realize is we don't ha use truly random vectors. Uh, if you have an algorithm, your algorithm probably only needs uh, two-order uh, randomness. Uh, in, in other words, any two bits are statistically independent. Uh, you might need fourth order independence, but never more than that that I'm, that I'm aware of. And it turns out that if you're looking at these pseudo-random vectors, you can store this vector in logarithm of its length. Uh, there's also an area called zero-knowledge proofs, uh, going to be very, very important because during your careers, you're going to be creating systems where privacy and security are very important. And uh, what, what you want to do um, is you want to have some way uh, of preserving privacy. And so one of the things, for example, I might want to prove to you that I know something, how to solve some problem, without giving you any information about how to solve it. And the way we would resolve that issue is by a zero-knowledge proof. I would give you a proof that I knew how to solve it and convince you I knew how to solve it, but give you absolutely zero information about how to do it. Um, another thing that uh, you're going to deal with high-dimensional data, and it turns out that high-dimensional data is fundamentally different than the two and three dimensions that your intuition probably uh, learned. Uh, one of the things, if in two dimensions you pick two points at ra several points at random, you will get a wide distribution of distances. But if you pick points in high dimension, uh, it turns out all the distances between points will be the same. And this is kind of important because if you're doing clustering in high dimension, it may be very unstable. Uh, it, it's also true that if you generate a point and change your coordinate system so that that point is sort of at the north pole of a unit sphere, let's say we're generating unit length vectors, and then you generate a second point, I can guarantee it'll be on the equator. Uh, the reason I can guarantee that is it turns out that all of the surface area of a high dimensional sphere is at the equator. 
That's not true in three dimensions. Those of you that flew here from the US probably spent a fair amount of time uh, flying over the, uh, up near the North Pole. Uh, but if you were in 100 dimensions, in fact, actually 10 or 20 dimensions, this phenomenon occurs, uh, all of the surface area is at the equator. Now, that may bother you a little bit because I didn't tell you where the North Pole is. Pick any point on the sphere you want for the North Pole and find the, the, a plane perpendicular to that. And that will define your equator but it'll be a different equator depending on where you pick the North Pole. But the next point you generate will be on the equator no matter where you put it. Okay, these are just exciting things uh, uh, to deal with. Uh, by, by the way, I, I should tell you that if, if you want to, uh, most of the things, many of the things I'm talking about, uh, there's a book that I'm writing with Ravi Kanan and Avram Blum. And there's a copy of it on my web page. If you go there, you can just download it. Uh, one of the ways the world is changing, by the way, is when I was growing up, um, if you were going to write a book, you would publish it. Uh, but today, people realize that if you want to make money on a book, don't publish it. Give it away for free. <laughs> uh, the reason, the amount of royalties you would get from publishing it is relatively small. But if you give it away for, for free, many more people will read it. Your reputation will improve more than it would if it was published. And the resources that you will get, a higher faculty salary and so forth, will be much greater. So we're giving the book away for free. <laughs> uh, if anybody is teaching and wants to use it, uh, just download the PDF, take it to the local print shop, tell them to print it for you, uh, and just charge the students what it costs to, to print it. Um, in, in, we did publish it, though, in China, because we found a publisher who would sell it to students for $6. And we thought for $6, that was less than the cost of, of Xeroxing it or, or printing it. Uh, anyway, they're just exciting research areas. Uh, there are just many more. But let me come back to the fundamental thing that I would like to leave you with. Uh, computer science has undergone a fundamental change. Uh, the problems that we're dealing with are just totally different than what we dealt with in the last 40 years. Uh, Secondly, there's, the, there's just really exciting research uh, to get involved. And those individuals, institutions, and nations who position themselves for the future are just going to benefit immensely. And I, I just want to tell you, your careers are probably going to be fantastic because the world is changing at a very rapid pace. And if, if you position yourself for the future, you, you'll have just a, a great career. And with that, I would just like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk. So we have time for a couple of questions. And then we started a couple of minutes late, so we'll go into the break. Michael will also get his 45 minutes. Uh, are there a couple of, are there any questions out there? Well, Oh, I, I can repeat it for you. Let me, let me repeat the question. Uh, he uh, is working in China a lot and working on hidden structures in social graphs. And I was just wondering if the Chinese government is interested in all these hidden structures in the social graph of China. Yeah, my, my, my work in China is, is really different. Um, I, I'm interested in improving their educational system nationwide. So, but in order to learn about their culture, because when I first started working for them, I asked, what do you want me to do? And they said, change our culture in universities. And I had to ask, what are you talking about? <laughs> but so I, I, I go over there, I teach courses there twice a year. Uh, but it's sort of independent. The government doesn't know what I'm teaching. Uh, 
uh, and, and nobody is, they're, they're happy that the students I teach get into PhD programs in the US. And uh, so there's, but it is one interesting thing. Uh, uh, a program manager here in, in the United States happened to be talking to me and he, he, he said, this is important, uh, write me a proposal and it's funded. So, uh, but China, China doesn't really know what I'm doing. Hello, uh, thank you for the amazing talk. Um, I have one specific question regarding deep learning. Um, in a couple of years, at least in Europe, uh, there's going to be a new law that says that any decision that has to be taken algorithmically has, uh, people have a right to ask for an explanation for that decision. Uh, I do not know much about deep learning, but a lot of things that I hear is that uh, sometimes they, you do not really know what's happening underneath the layers. Um, how do you think uh, deep learning has impacts on these aspects of society? Right, so, so one thing, uh, deep learning is starting to be used in many applications, but they're really, uh, the theory of deep learning really is non-existent. Uh, and the reason I'm interested in this particular area is I would like to teach it. And to know how to teach it, we've got to learn what is really happening and uh, the literature simply does not know uh, what's, what's really happening. Uh, they, they know that it's very effective in many applications. Uh, so for, I hope many people here will work on deep learning and publish some papers so that I can better teach the material.